welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining the latest installment of our Cell and Gene webinar series. I'm Janet Lambert, the CEO of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. And today we're pleased to present a program for you on cell and gene therapy market access in a COVID-19 world, challenges and opportunities. We have a terrific group of experts here to talk to you about the ways in which the pandemic is and is not changing the challenges and opportunities that we all face in achieving successful market access for modern cell and gene therapies. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna tell everybody a little bit about the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine or ARM. We are an international advocacy organization dedicated to realizing the promise of safe and effective regenerative medicines for patients around the world. In our lexicon, regenerative medicine is cell and gene therapy and tissue engineering. Our organization has 350 members, organizations of all different types, companies and nonprofits and other sector stakeholders spread across 25 countries. Our priorities are really to establish clear and predictable regulatory pathways for regenerative medicine, to enable market access and value-based reimbursement policies. We address the industrialization and manufacturing hurdles of the space and we compile sector data and use it to educate the media and other sector stakeholders. ARMS developed a set of special uh, resources here in light of the pandemic. Uh, this webinar series is one part of that. We've held a number of uh, webinars already and have a few more planned. You can find those on our website along with a new COVID-19 resource library curated specifically for the cell and gene community. We've launched a CEO discussion forum uh, for the CEOs of organizations within ARM so that they can share the challenges of managing an organization and launching products in this era. And then we've also adapted an existing weekly sector newsletter that we have in order to have a particular feature on those issues related to COVID. Those and other ARM resources are available to you at our website, www.alliancerm.org. If you uh, have interest in the webinar series, you can also find that uh, at our website. The next webinar uh, may not be appropriate for this audience, but maybe for colleagues of yours, along with the Every Life Foundation and some other patient community partners. We'll be launching a webinar on, on uh, value-based payments 101, and that will be next Wednesday, June 3rd at noon. So on to today's program. Uh, again, we're going to talk about market access in the COVID world. Uh, after this brief introduction of mine, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Faulkner from Evadera, who will lead a moderated discussion with a panel of experts. Uh, and then we will leave some time at the end for your questions and answers. I'd ask you to use the Q&A function of Zoom and not the chat function. We won't be looking for questions in the chat function, just in the Q&A function. So with that, uh, let me introduce my, my uh, colleagues here. This is a webinar that ARM is doing in conjunction with the National Association of Managed Care Physicians and its Medical Directors Institute and Evadera. So we have a terrific moderator in Eric Faulkner, who's done a lot of work with ARM over the years and is the Vice President of Precision and Transformative Medicine at Evadera, as well as the Executive Director of the Genomics, Biotech and Emerging Medical Technology Institute at NAMCP. Eric has helped us bring together a group of, of experts and practitioners in the field of market access. And I'll turn it over to him and to those panelists to introduce themselves and kick off the program today. Thanks, Eric, for joining us. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, 
and thanks so much everyone for joining today and then good to see you there rick we've got you on now too so we are good to go um so so um just uh before we jump in i've been working in this space of cell and gene therapy for 25 years of my career starting out as a cell and gene therapy scientist uh, from the time um, when cell and gene therapies didn't work all the way through to today when now they do work, thankfully, and bringing transformative solutions that, you know, we, we really haven't seen before to uh, patients in the healthcare community. And it's my pleasure to um, introduce a, a distinguished panel here of, of payer experts that are the folks uh, across which desk information slides for, for new technology acceptance. And we're gonna have a really, uh, I think, insightful discussion today. I'll let them do a quick introduction of themselves. Uh, Jim, I'll start with you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Jim Cross. Um, I do healthcare consulting, uh, but my previous role was at Aetna for 18 years, where I was the vice president and head of national medical policy and operations. Uh, and in that, uh, capacity uh, dealt with uh, emerging technologies and coverage decisions and reimbursement policy. Thank you. Rick? Good morning. Good morning, Eric, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Rick Powell, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer of a Management Services Organization, which is kind of an odd California entity, and we're delegated by the health plans essentially to perform all the health plan functions. So uh, I've got about a million and a half lives uh, uh, under management at this point, uh, doing all of the standard sort of authorization review and case management and uh, very hands-on sort of programs. So uh, I've been interested in uh, cell and gene therapies for a long time, had the pleasure of working with Eric pretty closely on this for a good while and I'm looking forward to the program. Thank you, and, and Mike. Uh, Mike Ackerman, formerly Senior Medical Director of Anthem Blue Cross. Nice to be here. Hey, thank you so much. So, so I think we'll just go ahead and jump right in. We're going to have more of a casual discussion about some of these topics. And, you know, we understand that there may not be a, a crystal ball for uh, everything that is unfolding here, but just trying to get a directional sense of uh, some of the impacts as they pertain to managed care, to you know, patients, uh, Im implications for providers, and then, you know, more broadly, what does this mean uh, to or for transformative therapies that, um, as assuming meeting their promise can mean both either transforming disease or in some cases curing uh, disease outright, depending on the definition. You know, we were just seeing the first wave of, of uh, you know, a half a dozen or so therapies that are that are on the market globally now with another wave close behind and um, over a thousand clinical trials with more than 75 uh, therapies in phase three and uh, several hundred in, in phase two. Uh, so what we see now is just the beginning of a, a larger uh, emphasis and um, we're going to see more of these to come. But the first question that I would like to pose the panel is, is the broader one, which is from your perspectives, uh, what kind of um, impacts or implications do you see COVID-19 having on the U.S. healthcare system? What are you seeing out there in the trenches of, of managed care right now? If you could please, uh, and, and I don't necessarily have to call. If you want to volunteer to jump in, that's fine. Otherwise, I can kind of call names as we go if we need to. Well, since I'm at the far left of the picture screen, which may just be a Zoom function, I guess I'll dive in first. I, I think um, probably the overriding impact is going to be economic. Uh, the fact that given the impact on the economy, the number of folks losing their jobs, that's obviously going to be mirrored in loss of insurance coverage. A lot of the people who had commercial insurance no longer do a number of the companies that were offering commercial insurance no longer exist. Uh, and we have just no idea uh, what the recovery is going to look like. Certainly here in Los Angeles, where we've been battened down for three months and change now, uh, there's, there's grave misgiving as to the number of companies that are even going to be able to reopen. So I think from a commercial standpoint, there's going to be an impact there. Conversely, all those folks who lose their commercial coverage are now being dumped into the, the Medicaid roles. 
So uh, we already see the projections for a huge in number, of, increase in the number of folks who are filing for Medicaid. And even though the, the governor has uh, proposed uh, a larger budget for Medicaid, Medi-Cal here in California, they're already talking about what sort of services they're gonna have to cut on an individual basis. So we can talk about that as we go along in terms of what the, the Medi-Cal cuts are already proposed, but I think the economic one is gonna be dramatic. Okay, yeah, I remember when we, when we first uh, uh, got this topic and uh, my first reaction uh, was, I don't know what the hell COVID-19 has to do with cell and gene therapy, but uh, so from a, um, from a clinical and coverage perspective uh, of how insurers will uh, approach gene therapy, I actually don't think that's going to change much. I think they're going to go through the same process of the FDA and making their clinical decisions and all that sort of normal way of, of deciding how to cover something uh, is going to be essentially the same. <clears throat> I would agree that the biggest impact is going to be the economic impact on the healthcare system. So are there going to be very uh, difficult decisions that are going to have to be made in terms of what those plans can afford, whether they're a commercial plan, large or small, different challenges, uh, whether they're um, a Medicaid plan with the state budget issues, uh, I, and, I th and I think just a lot of uh, uh, individuals not even being, going to be able to afford to buy into the exchanges. So sure. I think that um, the lack of insurance, or if they do have insurance, the lack of the available funds uh, within those entities is going to be a huge challenge because most of these gene therapies, as all of us know, are quite expensive. Uh, we sort of have gotten through the first wave because they're primarily treating rare diseases. Uh, so they're expensive, but they're rare. As the, the phases of products uh, expand and they start to treat more and more and more common things, the burden will just become greater. Uh, and again, we'll talk more about this, but I think uh, it's going to be a, sort of a a question of whether there needs to be a federal uh, approach and sort of uh, bailout for providing for these kinds of therapies because most of the individual employer-based plans, the health insurance plans, and the Medicaid world uh, are not going to be able to handle this on their own. Sure. Thank you, Chairman. I think Mike. realistically, uh, given the the ongoing social distancing or physical distancing um, and, and minimalization of outside activities, I think there are a, a lot of people who would otherwise would be using healthcare are now still cho choosing to stay at home. Um, so the, the, uh, being concerned that, uh, the, that the risk of exposure is still there. Um, physicians that I have spoken to um, indicate the fact that the, their practices are down as much as 70% initially. That may obviously change, but I mean, uh, uh, this has affected salaries of their clinical staff, some, uh, 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 some furloughs uh, uh, um, per se, and some layoffs. Um, so, there, um, and there's been an increased amount of um, unemployment uh, insurance claims from healthcare businesses um, who are seeing this kind of issues. So I think despite the relief from governments, um, uh, I think the, the, we're, we're still, we're very much at the early stage of, of the long-term effects of, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Um, and it's going to be far more prolonged than people initially thought. Sure. And Thank as you. as you say, it's affecting a, a lot of the elective uh, procedures and visits for sure. Uh, that I'm in South Florida, and we are just now starting to open up uh, elective procedures. And even on the news, they were 
concerned and and sort of advocating for patients to get the necessary care or even the elective care that they are hesitant to actually go to the hospitals in particular because of their concern about the exposure to, to the virus. So I think as we reopen the economy gradually, uh, again, I think it's going to be, um, you know, an economic challenge uh, for those healthcare institutions and for the physician providers. But specific to cell and gene therapy, I still don't think that that will change all that much because they're rare diseases, they're more or less uh, serious or life-threatening in nature. And, you know, if people really need that particular uh, therapy that they're they're still likely to be able to get it in the in the interim. I yeah. think it's going to be a bigger challenge over time as we face more and more of this economic uh, situation. I would agree with Jim in the fact that we're we're tracking the numbers literally on a daily basis, and we definitely did see a fall off in elective services, although. Uh, looking at, for example, chemotherapy, there was absolutely no drop in that. The dialysis continued right along. So relatively more expensive, more intensive things for sicker folks uh, pretty much continued right along. And as of the last three weeks, we've seen a huge rebound in authorizations and requests for elective procedures, like everybody's out there kind of making up for lost time. So for the last three weeks, we've been way above baseline in terms of, of requests and authorizations for elective procedures. So I think it was more a matter of postponement of those uh, than actually loss of those services. So the economic impact, it, they, there was some thought that there might be some economic benefit uh, for foregone services, and it looks like that's not happening. So uh, and, and, that, that honeymoon didn't exist. And, and, and you know, talking about sort of priorities and where we where we are now, you know, folks are making decisions or thinking about their checklist at home if you're a patient or a caregiver, you know, do I have a place to live? Can I feed myself or my family? Uh, for, for many of these cell and gene therapy, at least initial targets, not all obviously, some of them could fall into an elective kind of scenario depending on what they're being used to treat uh, or address, but many of them, um, a lot of them are either targeted either to niche populations or pediatric populations with profound unmet need, uh, where, where some of the parents of the pediatric patients would be thinking, take care of my child first, then do I have a place to live, and then can I feed my family as, as kind of an equal priority. Um, or oncology patients, that's the other with the CAR T therapies place we're seeing. So those are more got to have. But in, in this environment that we see unfolding where there may be alternative types of therapies. How do you see that playing into the dynamic? So if providers may be understaffed, if they're having their own set of financial pressures, um, if you're coming in and it's the only treatment that's available for a very profound unmet need, rare disease, that's one thing, but where there are other therapies available, how might that play into a decision Continuum on the on the payer side, I, I hear from Jim that it likely is not going to change the process. The process is going to continue to operate as it does, albeit the scrutiny around how good uh, the evidence package looks may be more sensitive or profound. But but how does it how does it work when you have alternatives in this kind of environment where there may be a reimbursement question or a more challenging administrative pathway, what might that mean and how should we think about it in the context of these things? I can definitely see more downward pressure to um, sort of do step therapy. We certainly saw this, I, I always draw the example of the, the hepatitis therapies, which in, the, in their day seemed very expensive. Now we laugh and look back kind of smiling at what a bargain they were. But um, when they first came out and people kind of opened their eyes wide at the, at the cost compared to alternative options at the time, there were a number of qualifying benchmarks that were established, the criteria for of, of medical necessity. And they, they were pretty strenuous. They've since loosened as we've seen the effectiveness of the therapies and the, the real benefit. But in the beginning, you really had to jump through some flaming hoops 
to get those therapies. And I can certainly see as the economic pressures continue to mount, um, maybe a similar scenario may exist with these where there are alternative and less expensive options that there might be more, more pressure downward to exercise those. I don't see that at all. I mean, I, I see, I see that uh, this has not changed the fact that these are orphan diseases. I mean, the issue of, of paying for them and the methodologies of paying them remain, uh, remain uh, unchanged. But I mean, quite frankly, um, I don't see where the prior authorization process is going to change at all. Um, uh, similar to uh, people who had, um, with uh, chemotherapy or, or, or dialysis, um, uh, uh, these are um, these are ongoing issues uh, that were completely independent of this crisis. Well, I think uh, one of the things that we'll have to think about <clears throat> is the difference between these. I'll call them really serious genetic diseases early on in 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 childhood or serious uh, uh, diseases like uh, cancer, <clears throat> I think, and rare, and the fact that they're rare. I think if you start to move to where there are treatments that are gene therapies, uh, where there are in fact alternative treatments that seem to work, there'll be two challenges. One is the long-term evidence of whether these gene therapies actually are durable and that uh, there won't be initially a lot of long-term data to compare with the probable longer-term data that we have with the existing therapies. So I think there will be an uh, evidence challenge. Uh, and then on top of that, once they try uh, convince people that they uh, have enough evidence that it is an, uh, uh, a viable alternative or even potentially a superior treatment, uh, then they're going to run into the uh, economic pressures of which ones would we consider medically necessary, which is typically the less expensive of the alternatives uh, in using the medical necessity language in the in the contracts. And so if the treatments are, are equivalent, uh, I think some of these more expensive gene approaches will not be considered medically necessary, and they will prefer the uh, the less expensive uh, traditional treatments. If it's superior and actually can prove it superior, then uh, the challenge will be how do we pay for it? Sure, and the thing about the hep C treatments was it was other than things like surgeries and vaccinations, you know, a few examples, it was one of the first times we've seen a treatment cure something so so in that case it was you could be yeah. reinfected and there were some other other things that kind of went along there but you know here we have if these therapies aren't curative the ability of them to transform outcomes um, is likely to be unlike a lot of things that we've seen in the past that are addressing the, the symptoms but these uh, have the potential to be disease modifying even if they don't um, universally impact all patients i want to i want to uh Look at the duration issue because one of the there there are two, three things that make these therapies different from other therapies. One is the magnitude of effect, the promise of transforming or curing disease to take existing treatment uh, paradigms off the table. The need for you know engaging the system um, in the same capacity because the the impact may last years or a lifetime. The other one is duration of effect, which you've which you've mentioned. And the third is an ability to influence patient-centric outcomes in a way that we may not even understand how to measure properly given the, the nature of some of these therapies. But for duration, it's sort of always the chicken and the egg uh, kind of issue. There's only so much evidence you'll be able to come to market with at the time of FDA approval for these therapies. Uh, there are things that one can do, which is collect any evidence from treated populations early in the development, even in the very earliest phases, anytime the therapy touches the patient, then at least understand how up until launch and beyond it impacts outcomes. But, but is that an area where our practices might change? So there may be, you know, an evidence package that's available at the time of launch. Uh, as more and more of these therapies come on board, would we begin to uh, evolve um, 
more rigorous re-evaluation processes, like look at them at year one, at year two, and then manage them in a different way than maybe we manage conventional agents? Is that something we might anticipate coming from this, where maybe the need, maybe the transformative need has a benefit? Maybe there are benefits um, in regards to what we've seen as sort of lessons learned from COVID in terms of how patients engage systems and, and other things. How do we address this duration issue and does it does it have anything to do with COVID or is it just more of a groundswell of these therapies entering the environment? Well, they're gonna have to have the FDA approval and the uh, labeled indication. So I would assume that most payers are going to follow that FDA label and indication. And then they're further going to do, which was suggested earlier, uh, be much more strict about the patient criteria selection. So okay. they will try to reflect what the studies were done on. So if there were um, sort of targeting for certain patients and criteria for who would be in the study, the payers are going to use that same kind of uh, patient selection or, or targeted population selection in their approval process. You can bet that they're going to be on pre-authorization and they're going to want to make sure that the, that the patient has had um, the appropriate testing, the appropriate uh, identification of the, of the possibility of it being the right thing for them. And then I think to the question of step therapy, I think if it's not one of these major transformative, really serious rare diseases, and it's that next phase of uh, a me too or another alter alternative where there is treatment for it, uh, again, I think there'll be a fair amount of scrutiny and expectation that the conservative treatment has to come first before they'll move to, um, to the gene therapy until the gene therapy can be actually shown to, to actually be durable and, and over a longer period of time actually represent a better treatment. And then that over time, that gene therapy may move to earlier into the treatment cycle. Yeah. But in the beginning, in the beginning, traditionally, uh, historically, uh, it takes time for that treatment to move first line as opposed to being second and third line if there are alterna alternatives. I agree. I think these will be positioned as later day therapies, if you will, last resort type options, um, not only because of their, their novelty and their cost, but because of lack of long-term durability data. And there's a, there's a burden on industry at this point to supply adequate documentation of benefit by the very nature of how rare these diseases are. So you know, if, if we were going to bring out a blood pressure medicine, it's no challenge to get a thousand people on our drug at, at the get go. Yeah. When you're dealing with a very rare orphan disease, it may be a real chore to get three patients on and get data. So we, as the decision makers, are being asked to extend authorization based on a series of two. Um, that's a real challenge for us. I think the issue, quite frankly. Uh, is not prior authorization and, and, um, and, and diagnosis. That's a given. Um, the, and, and that's not likely to change. I mean, the issue is going to be in potentially narrowing the, uh, the, uh, uh, those candidates who, who should get the drug based on, on uh, additional data that would be requested from companies. But more importantly is the outcome. I mean, uh, and what is a realistic outcome um, ba ba uh, based on uh, um, the opinions of pharma, the member, or the parent, uh, the, uh, the physician, um, and the uh, managed care organization over what period of time, um, and, w uh, and uh, whether, whether everybody would be, whether there would be a consensus of agreement on what a val uh, uh, a, an, an outcome would be remains to be seen. And, and, and just to interpret that a little bit, you know, there, there have been some therapies, not all of them have been um, advanced therapies like cell and gene, but they have been 
um, emerging biologicals, uh, often for rare disease, where we've seen U.S. commercial payers uh, do things that they haven't really done as much of before. One is limit access to subpopulations. So FDA may say, you know, we've got this much space, and you may say, well, you only have enough data to support use in certain subpopulations. You don't have enough data to support use in others. And the other thing is uh, something that alludes to something that Jim mentioned earlier, which is um, the outcomes need to be clear. Some of the diseases that are being targeted by these therapies are not all made the same. Some of the diseases are, you know, fast fatal, where, where you may have a pediatric patient you know, die without an intervention within a few weeks. Others may be uh, rare diseases that have not really had a solid treatment, sometimes e even not great symptomatic treatments that unfolds over the, sp the span of 20 or 30 years, which makes it much harder, uh, you know, to have that direct correlation of impact. You're often left with surrogates. Sometimes those surrogates may or may not be, you know, as well established. So with the hep C, drug uh, set, you know, we understood what viral titer level changes meant. That was well established in the literature. Any, any sort of thoughts in this environment that we'll be moving into where scrutiny is higher, if there's uncertainty around how to interpret the clinical outcomes versus something that may be crystal clear, uh, where this is viewed as, okay, it's, it's a no-brainer that this is either transformative or curative, for those ones that may be unclear, more marginally effective, just to reiterate, you're saying those would, would likely have much stronger hurdles to overcome. I would just agree with that. I would agree with that in general. I think that's what I was trying to get at, was the idea that if they are not sort of obviously these black and white scenarios, but the condition is more gray, or it takes yeah. time to evolve, uh, with all the side effects that, that happen. Uh, I think that's what's going to be uh, the challenge is to try to have the evidence around what's the uh, existing standard of care versus what is this gene, gene therapy um, treatment. And it, just like now, they're going to be compared to the standard of care that's out there today. And if that standard takes two, three, four years to evaluate and and show uh, a, uh, a measurable difference or a measurable outcome, um, then that's what's gonna be expected. And I think the measurement of the outcome is gonna vary depending upon the condition. I mean, it depends on what we're talking about, whether it's a, a very difficult um, subjective kind of uh, symptoms that the patient has, that measuring it is all subjective, uh, that makes it very difficult when there's not a, you know, a really good um, uh, type of uh, measurement that is more objective. So it, it's going to vary by condition. I just think it's going to be a, a, a greater burden of evidence development if the, if the gene treatment is for something that is uh, already uh, having standard available treatment for it and that fact that it is not as a rare and that it is more common uh i or you know like the third phase of gene therapy those are going to have i think tremendous challenges in terms of uh having the data uh to go up against what i would call the standard of care yeah, and maybe i'm sorry I, I, eric I, getting to your point about the 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 treatment options as you said a number of these situations only have at best symptomatic approaches right now, certainly nothing transformative. And the timelines on a lot of these are really going to be challenging. If you're talking about, you know, I think the decision is a little clearer and more straightforward on those things that, that hit devastatingly in infancy. But for other situations that may not really manifest until adolescence, adulthood, uh, it's going to be tough to ask us to accept surrogates for things that aren't going to appear you know, in clinical manifestation for 20 years. Uh, it puts a real burden on industry to kind of develop some sort of surrogate that we're going to accept, and then on us to buy into the surrogates that are presented. And, and I'd like to touch on and three areas that go along here, you know, quickly. Um, 
we understand that the economic implications are just starting to be felt. Um, you know, there, there are three buckets. So employers, uh, every employer in the United States, if not around the world in most markets, is really having to be cautious, careful. Uh, some may not come back from this. You know, we're going to, we're, we're already seeing significant spikes in unemployment, unlike anything we've seen since the Great Depression. Um, from the employer side, uh, can you share what this may mean in terms of how employers may be able, what they may or may not be able to do if budgets are constrained? How might this influence more costly therapies if they're transformative? And then I would also like to understand same sort of thought, you know, at the state level. You know, we we're seeing, as Rick mentioned, a groundswell in, in Medicaid, you know, eligibles. And you know, we can't make any pie. We, we talked in the prep call about we can't make more pie. The pie actually is going to be smaller. The pie is shrinking uh, just because of the economic constraints. And it's been hard enough for a lot of states, as we discussed, to afford to pay firemen, teachers, you know, police workers, frontline people. Uh, and they've, they've always been strained about, you know, how do we cover the cost of very expensive therapies, even if they're rare, and particularly if there are alternatives. Can we spend a bit of time just talking about what you might see as the employer and the Medicaid impacts of COVID here? And then about how long, and we don't have a crystal ball, but are we talking a year or two, three to five years? You know, if we can't talk about what a recovery might look like, but would love to understand your thoughts based on how you're interfacing with you know, some of these uh, scenarios with employers and, and Medicaid agencies uh, about some of the constraints they may face and how it applies to uh, cell and gene ther therapies, even if they are transformative or curative. Well, I think as long as they, they are rare and they're in the pediatric and cancer uh, arenas, the, the stomach for not covering them or limiting their coverage at this point in time, I don't think is there. Yeah. Um, I think that even as we get through this over the next year and we have all these economic pressures, treatments in those categories are still, um, you know, going to be very difficult to, to not cover, uh, both from a commercial payer perspective and from an employer perspective. And most of the self-insured customers uh, go with the fiduciary responsibility of their administrative payer. And again, they don't want to take that um, sort of public scrutiny uh, uh, of denying these kinds of treatments. I think more of the challenge in the gene therapy arena will happen as they expand beyond the current uh, uh, ballpark of what diseases they're addressing. Yeah, I very much agree. I think tough decisions will have to be made. And I agree with Jim that, you know, if you're dealing in the, the oncology arena, the pediatric devastating disease arena, um, people will really stretch to accommodate those services. Yeah. But as things become less important uh, and less meeting the public eye, uh, more discretionary, I think tougher decisions will, will certainly have to be made because as you said, Eric, there, there's only so much pie and it's already gonna have to be stretched farther. Uh, we look at here in California, we went in the course of two months uh, from having a gigantic, enormous state surplus to now tens of billions of dollars in deficit. And that's only gonna get worse because we're, we're not gonna see the, the tax dollars start rolling in to refill those coffers. If anything, as more and more businesses bite the dust, those tax dollars are gonna shrink even farther. So the pie is getting smaller and smaller with greater need. So I think in the, the oncology space, in the devastating pediatric disease space, there's some, still some room for uh, negotiation, but in, in the, the, the other areas, the more marginal mm -hmm. areas, I think scrutiny is gonna be very, very strenuous like cardiovascular, orthopedics, yeah. um, some, some neurological indications that are progressive but may exactly. have other alternatives. Yeah. If you've got a neurologic disease that may have a 20-year development span, 
um, there may be a tendency to push these things off for five years until the budget's re re restored so, and then catch, catch up later. Well, go talk to Farmer about that. But the, 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 the fact is, is that uh, I don't see, I think the review process um, is, is, is not going to change. I think the issue of potentially pushing for more realistic outcomes that, uh, that, that correlate with what physicians are seeing will be important, correlate with, uh, with longer term outcomes that, that uh, we can really see whether, it, uh, whether something is transformative or curative will be, uh, will be um, more important in, uh, before dispensing dollar. But the evaluation I don't see is, ch is going to change at all. Okay. Any, any, do, do you see scenarios where um, state Medicaid agencies may categorically make decisions either about cell and gene therapy at a certain price level or any therapy at a certain price level? Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of talking with the ARM NAMCP collaborations that have happened in the past and the papers that have come out. The third one on, on provider side impacts is on its way. Uh, but the other ones that are more the reimbursement roadmap and what's happening in managed care, that these therapies, um, because of their cost and because they're single administration and because the system's not necessarily built to make multiple payments on things if, if, if it happens one time, um, have we've talked about some of the rare disease therapies and some of the more expensive therapies, at least in a volume basis, like uh, the hep C product uh, having the potential to bankrupt small health plans and that that's already happened. It's already how, happened. Do you, how do you see that play out in this environment? Is it more likely that we're going to hit a tipping point? I mean, it's a cash flow issue. If you have a therapy that's in the price range that these therapies are and it's single administration um, and you're in a position where all you can do is just make a single payment, then um, how does the how does the environment impact that? Does it make it more likely to er erect barriers to it because you can't handle the cash flow, the lightning strike of a, a therapy that may fall in these price points of roughly you know four hundred thousand to as much as two million dollars, irrespective of their value? Given the oh, issues, always... given the issues of the uh, of, of the deficits that uh, state and state governments. Um, are, are, in, are incurring right now with issues of paying, as mentioned previously, uh, police, fire, fire, teachers, sanitation. I think there's going to be an, an increasing degrees of, uh, of, uh, of difficulty in, in, in getting Medicare and Medicaid, that is, to pay for, for um, a, a often gene therapy that, that would be in excess of, of, of a half a million dollars. I think that's going to be very much of a challenge. Well, I think this whole arena begs for some uh, innovative solutions to the payment mechanisms uh, for these treatments. I mean, we've always talked about uh, different ways to try to approach it depending upon uh, what the situation is, whether it's commercial or uh, Medicaid. But it's, it almost begs for a federal kind of collaborative response. I, I don't see these kinds of therapies continuing to expand and having the, the private sector or the states be able to keep up with what they have to put out in terms of medical cost expenses. I think there's going to have to be some at some point, especially as more and more of these roll out, uh, that uh, that there's going to have to be some kind of a government program for these gene therapy uh, pr approaches. I see it as sort of a, an assigned risk pool that everyone can buy into for a reasonable amount of money and spread that risk over a, a gigantic population is probably the only way that we can bear these costs. Um, we're already talking about the, the state Medicaid agencies. We're already seeing elimination of services. Admittedly, they're not the hot button, high drama, issues of a, of a little child with a devastating illness, but they're just by fiat eliminating dental work, eliminating podiatry. I talked the other day when we were all on the phone about podiatry is gone. They're talking about eliminating autism services. So some things that do have some um, high public profile 
uh, and certainly have their advocates out there, but aren't the sort of thing that you're going to necessarily see on the five o'clock news. But the, you know, when pushed to the brink, these agencies are fully capable of just saying, we flat don't have enough money. And what they'll do is they'll flip the blame to pharma. They'll say, you know, look at, look at how galling the, the nerve of these people when, when people don't have food for them to demand $2 million, $4 million for this treatment uh, is absurd when the state doesn't have, you know, we'd be happy to cover uh, something at a reasonable cost, but it's unrealistic in this environment to expect us to pay a half a million dollars, a million dollars, $2 million for a therapy. So I think- Even, the, the, even the, if that were spread over time. Harm. I'm sorry, did, Eric? E even, even if that were spread over time, you know, with some of the more recent launches, you know, they're, they're looking at three to five year payback periods and, and, and trying to do something innovative in terms of that how we pay the for them. And, and that could definitely at, ease the pain and make it more palatable. Yeah, and I, as Jim said, I think all of this begs a, a creative solution. The, I think the it has to be situation not, is not sustainable. Yeah, I think it's got to be some non-traditional approach. I don't know. I don't have the answer, whether it's uh, amateurization or whether it's five payments over five years or whatever uh, schema we come up with. But at the end of the day, even if we change the payment methodology, I still think the federal government is going to have to be there like they have been for chronic uh, kidney disease or other sort of broad um, really expensive, destructive diseases that individuals just can't, individual companies and individual payers and Medicaid uh, can't sustain on their own. And again, it may be a very different environment now versus post-election. Uh, what the current, you know, what the current administration may consider reasonable may be very different from if there's a successor administration, what they may deem reasonable. Sure. So the potentially changing political landscape may also shift the view on this. We just don't have people, and, and people, and, and because we're at the cost, because we're, you know, in, in that cycle, maybe there's less, it's unclear what the appetite is for going for a, like a, a, a paradigm changing uh, solution right now, potentially. I mean, I know we I, I don't think, I don't think anything's going to happen under this Republican administration. I think, if, uh, if you don't have, uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to make a political statement here necessarily, but if you don't have a more uh, Democrat approach to the Obamacare approach, to the idea that you know, socialism and taking care of the society is not necessarily an all bad thing, uh, I, I don't see how uh, they would be willing to expand basically uh, the healthcare uh, commitment to the American public. When you look at even the states that chose to expand Medicaid versus those that didn't, there was, there was certainly a, a political slant to that. So in, when you're making long-term plans, you have to take the changing and potentially shifting sands of the politics uh, into account if you're industry. Politics aside, I don't, I mean, although this is a, 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 an an interesting idea. I think the uh, 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 the this administration, or um, if this administration is is uh, replaced in in uh, five months, are going to be dealing with the economic crises. Um, and quite frankly, I think something something like this will likely be put on the back burner for a while, um, given the 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 needs of getting people back to work. Uh, um, uh, paying rent, uh, getting food, paying for utilities um, will, will be far more of um, an economic um, priority than, than creating uh, some sort of process for a rare, a rare um, genetic diseases. I think we're, we're at least a couple of years away, if not more. But I think there would be a different attitude about um, about expanding Medicaid, for example. So let's just say we've got to somehow get this American population insured more broadly. I, I still think that is is a is an issue that's going to be uh, in the forefront, primarily because we're going to have thirty plus million 
people that now don't have jobs and therefore don't have insurance and they 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 can't afford to put food on their table let alone to buy into an exchange to get insurance so i think this idea of health expand healthcare expansion uh is going to be part of the so-called package uh to help get us through this uh in the next uh year Is there anything that might serve as sort of a tipping point? So, so when we've talked about this before through the ARM NAMCP collaborations in the past, I mean, part of what we heard uh, from the commercial payer side is that, that you guys, you know, have plenty to focus on already. Um, and, and you're not really incented to create something new. It's just not maybe you have the ability to do so, but the incentive structure is not such that it would drive one commercial payer to go out on a limb and create a brand new, you know, approach for cell and gene therapies, whether it's innovative or not, it actually may be a risk, you know, for the organizations that do. Is there a tipping point? Is that like launch of a large disease area cell and gene therapy focus that may seem like, you know, the, the, the hep C type of scenario, if we see something you know, hit on a disease area that's a, a bit larger, like Parkinson's or kidney disease uh, or, or others. Is that enough of a, a threshold flip uh, given some of the economic pressures or would it be something else? Or do you think that it's just gonna be, you know, business as usual, unless some entity like the federal government or some other group steps in to try to create a fund or a pool uh, that may or may not include some kind of risk sharing or payback models or whatever it may be, do you think that we, we won't see change from that standpoint? Well, I, 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 I think, think go ahead. I think in terms of what uh, uh, we're seeing here, it's the price of these, uh, uh, the cost of these therapies have put this on the map. I mean, previously, often diseases weren't even on the radar screen. Go back and look at something like psoriasis, which is not an orphan disease, but this is not a disease that people die from or go into the hospital or, or, or go into the emergency room. What put psoriasis on the map was biologic uh, medications. And this is true with a number of other, uh, uh, other areas. So it's the price that, that, is, that, that, that has uh, alerted everybody. Uh, um, and, and that will still continue to be an issue let alone the issue of outcomes and, and realistic outcomes that would be acceptable and measurable by clinicians. Yeah, I think the tipping point would be when it moves from rare to more common volume diseases and for um, chronic diseases. Uh, I just think that's gonna tip the scale because right now with them being rare, you know, most at least large pairs or large companies can stomach it, but um, I, I think the gene therapies that get into the broader treatment realm, uh, I think that's going to really um, bring it to the forefront. As Eric said, we've already seen bankruptcies of smaller plans, you know, the one million member plans. I think we went, I think three of them went out of business here in California with only the hepatitis drugs, which were reasonably priced now in retrospect comparison to the, the challenge with some of these newer agents, these newer therapies. I think, I think in all honesty, the pressure is going to have to be top down, government down to the industry, um, because I think um, insurers are inherently conservative and no one wants to be the first one to take a dramatic step outside the arena. I think they'll yeah. be subject to a lot of criticism from the, their colleagues in the industry and the press and everybody else. So I, I think you're going to be battling the inherent conservatism of the, of the insurance industry to begin with. So you're probably far more likely to succeed uh, with action coming government downward. With, with, hey, um, Eric. Yes. This is Janet. You've got some questions queuing up in the Q&A, if you have a chance to take some of those. Yes, I've been asking through them, Janet, uh, already. Um, just, just not in the way they're worded. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but but uh, and, and I can switch and ask a, a couple that are that are they're popping out here. So we talked about you know some issues around what good looks like. Um, you know we have a question here about 
and this kind of it can, it can be cast more broadly, um, are you going to be looking at other sources of information? I mean, one thing that was clear with some of the NAMCP uh, survey work that we've done is that most payers haven't created some special mechanism or process for cell and gene therapy. Are you going to be looking to other outside sources more to help make determinations around, you know, medical necessity or uh, whether the outcomes look favorable or not, including using, you know, sort of up and coming sources like ICER reports and other, how, how do those weigh in, if at all, any differently than they may have in the past? Including since groups like ICER have taken a particular interest in cell and gene therapy and looked at that as how do we value this? I mean, how does that play into your decision making? Well, I think those are, um sources of information that get uh, looked at, but the large payers, I would say, have their own internal processes for making uh, technology assessment and medical necessity decisions, and that will continue to happen. Uh, I think uh, many of the smaller plans uh, follow what the big ones do, because uh, they don't have the resources to do the tech assessments that uh, the large ones do. Um, uh, CMS is a little bit different with the national coverage decisions and local coverage decisions, and they may uh, have a slightly different process. But uh, by and large, I don't think that the decision-making process for gene therapy is going to be the issue or change. I think the issue is going to be uh, what is the treatment for and what is the, the medical cost burden going to be. Yeah. I'd agree with Jim. I, I think the, the review process is going to remain intact. I think the sources are going to be largely the same. The plans will either be using their own internal review or they'll be looking to things like Millam and MCG or, or Hayes or any of the other outside sort of third party review options that have always been the case and will continue to be. Uh, so I, I don't really see that changing dramatically. Okay. Um, we have a question here and we're, we're getting close to time, but how, how do we think it may play if the U.S. ultimately for economic reasons or what have you shrinks away from one-time treatments uh, in larger therapeutic areas, um, perhaps due to price or economic impact when other more social uh, government systems may embrace them? Does that have anything to do with our decision making here? Um, or is it just the consequence of how we're structured and built uh, in terms of the pressures on our decision making? Is anybody aware about how the uh, UK or the European Union have embraced these often and uh, and um, and uh, uh, genetic uh, genetic th uh, therapies? Are they paying for them or not? Um, uh, Many of those that have uh, have launched, um, sometimes some of them are still in process, but it, with the exception of, of Glybera, which is an outlier, uh, most of them have been accepted. I think the mere fact that we have to ask that question shows how little we care about what goes <laughs> on in the rest of the world. In, in reality, I, I don't think our healthcare decisions are gonna be made based on what the rest of the world does. Well, anytime you have a government with a single payer um, solution, uh, they can decide what their budget is and what things that they think that they will pay for for their population. And, and they have their way to make those decisions like NICE in, in Great Britain. I mean, so they decide with their budget what they're gonna be able to pay for. They actually uh, have the leverage uh, to negotiate. Um, that's right. generally is not that's the right. case in this country. That's but we've right. seen those governments make hard decisions like saying, okay, you're 65, you don't qualify for dialysis anymore. Or you're a given age, you can't get a transplant anymore. Okay. History is rife with those. Yeah. And, and as, as our last question, this is kind of an interesting one um, because we're, we're coming right up on time. Um, given the kind of macroeconomic impact of, of what's happening with COVID-19, we're talking about risk pool or fund or what have you, how does that make it more affordable uh, given that the total cost still may be the same? Is it just the fact that it takes the pressure off of, uh, of the payers because there's a, it's something that you're not having to actively manage in the same way? How does that fund or pool solve the problem uh, 
uh, versus having that decision made at the individual plan level. Cash flow and spreading of risk. You're spreading and it out to 300 million Americans instead of the million people in your plan. And the government can keep printing money yeah. like it always does. Yep. And the debt, the debt keeps going higher, but at least they have the option to make the debt go higher. And who I mean, it's going to depend on who pays into that risk pool, um, uh, um, whether that's employers, whether it's health plans, um, and whether the fe federal government will put any money into that pool. Sure. I mean, the, the other real uh, sort of ethical uh, that risk uh, moral question is going to be, it's going to be what, uh, how much of our GDP do we spend on defense? How much do we to spend on all these other things instead of healthcare? Sure. As a parting, just a really quick, just sort of a one sentence thought, if there was in, in this environment, if there was any one you know, recommendation that you would have that would be helpful to the cell and gene therapy community in terms of ensuring, you know, availability of transformative and curative therapies to patients, what, what would your one pearl of wisdom be uh, as we conclude? Lower the price. <laughs> Since Jim already took that one, I'll, <laughs> I'll go with you as the kind of nature of these companies, they're full of really smart, creative, uh, out of the box thinking individuals and maybe put that brain power to use to come up with some alternative payment options. You know, be, come up with creative, creative ways to do this since Jim already took lower the price. <laughs> I think it is objective uh, and measurable outcomes that would be acceptable to clinicians and health plans. Well, thank, thank you guys so much. Uh, on behalf of ARM and NAMCP and also uh, Evadera, I want to thank you guys for, for the dialogue today. I know that this is something that's been on the mind uh, of the cell and gene therapy community going into uh, this pandemic, given the uncertainties for everyone. But thank you all for sharing your thoughts and uh, really enjoyed the dialogue and hope all those out there in the audience did as well. Uh, thanks again and, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Eric and Janet. We appreciate the opportunity. Everyone stay well. Thanks, Thank Janet. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, all. Thank Bye. you.